morning or good evening if you're in a different time zone and uh, a warm welcome to Insignia's first webinar of 2023. Uh, we've had a record registration level for this webinar so there's clearly still <laughs> significant interest in the topic of how to prepare for and respond to a cyber incident and we're no longer just talking about financial services, online businesses or consumer facing organisations. We've got representation on this call from sectors including food, finance, healthcare, transport, energy, mining, media, travel, energy, infrastructure, housing and so it goes on. This clearly uh, is an issue which is affecting pretty much every organization around the world. So before I leap into this, just uh, a few words of introduction from me. I'm Jonathan Hemus. I am the Managing Director of Insignia. Insignia is a specialist crisis management consultancy. We work with leaders of organizations around the world to help them do and say the right things on the worst days of their business lives and we do that through crisis management planning, training, exercising and sometimes advice during a live situation and of course one of those uh, risks which is high in everyone's risk register at the moment is indeed cyber security and cyber incidents. I'm also the author of a book Crisis Proof. Uh, more of that later. We'll be giving away three copies of the book um, at the end of this session. So again, thank you for joining me. What we're going to cover over the course of the next hour is a little bit of context. Uh, where are we in terms of cyber security? Um, some cases, taking learnings from two or three cases. I'm going to talk you through some one or two principles, processes, tools that we have found useful in applying to a cyber incident and then at the end of the session a mini scenario based exercise for you to uh, get your hands dirty and practice applying uh, some of the tools and maybe some of the principles that you've heard via the case studies. So please do feel free to post questions throughout. I will be taking them at the end um, but please, you know, if anything crops up or you wanted to clarify something or ask anything, post them in your uh, control panel and we'll try and cover as many of those at the end as possible. So, as I mentioned and as I think we all recognise, cyber incidents are not going away. They remain and are increasingly a sad fact of any organisation's day-to-day business these days. And in 2023, with just one month of it already gone, we've already seen a number of incidents in the media and there will be many more that are playing out behind closed doors. And one of the biggest in the UK in the last month is, of course, the challenges that Royal Mail faced when they were uh, attacked by a ransomware, and which meant that they couldn't send letters or parcels overseas, which clearly is a significant operational impact on the organization and I think what this situation as many of the uh, cyber incidents illustrate is that successfully responding to a cyber incident is about juggling two things at the same time it's about trying to fix the problem which is disrupting your organization whilst at the same time communicating in a way that retains the trust and confidence of your stakeholders and getting the balance between those two elements what you do and what you say getting the balance between those two right is always challenging in a crisis and i think it's particularly challenging in a cyber incident due to lack of information due to fear of saying too much but also fear of saying too little and losing the trust of your customers and certainly you know over a period of uh weeks on the operational side, it took Royal Mail quite a long time to get anywhere near back to normal in terms of people being able to send uh, packages and letters overseas. They also faced communication challenges with the BBC describing them as being tight-lipped. Um, we saw what often happens in these situations whereby 
the organization itself won't confirm publicly that they have been the victim of a ransomware attack, but a source provided the BBC with a screen grab of the ransom note which said your data are stolen and encrypted. So whilst Royal Mail didn't want to confirm that, journalists have sources that mean that they can get that information anyway. Clearly, as is often the case in situations like this, there was customer concern and indeed customer criticism. And of course, all sorts of other stakeholders waded in, for example, with the CEO having to appear before MPs and explain what had happened. So this is the kind of challenge that any organization faces when it's hit by a significant cyber incident. So before we move on to a couple of cases from a couple of years ago with I think some really interesting uh, learnings, I just wanted to set a little bit of context in terms of where are we with regards to cyber security and cyber risks at the moment. And um, Davos, which took place uh, last month, as you will know, as part of that, the World Economic Forum released its global cyber security outlook for the year. Uh, it's available to download. I'm going to give you a one minute snippet from it, but if you are interested in this subject, it's definitely worth downloading that report and taking a look at it. Um, one of the areas that they looked at, in fact, the key area that they looked at was how effective is that partnership between organizations, leaders, broader leaders, and those who lead the cyber uh, function, the, the, the CISOs and the CTOs? How is that relationship working and how effectively are they collaborating to prepare for and be ready to respond to cyber threats? And what they found was the good news is that awareness of cyber risks at an executive level has gone up. No longer are senior leaders unaware of the risk that cyber attacks pose. Indeed, they are acutely aware of it, with 43% of leaders thinking it likely that a cyber attack will materially affect their organization in the next two years. That's a staggering figure, um, probably very realistic, but uh, also quite scary. Unsurprisingly, the two things, the two most important things they're concerned about with regard to such attack are business disruption and reputational risk, which is exactly what we saw with regard to Royal Mail, um, their reputation challenge, but also their business severely hampered. And those are usually the two main parameters that you are wrestling with. Again, the good news is also that business leaders are more willing to address these risks rather than simply accept or worse, ignore them. They do have the mindset to do something about them. And that is being facilitated in many organizations by security leaders meeting with their board at least monthly. 56% are now doing that. However, the situation is still not perfect. And what the uh, World Economic Forum report found was that cyber leaders are still struggling to clearly articulate the risk that cyber issues pose in a way that business leaders fully understand and can act on. So understanding and engagement is up between these two parties and understanding of the broad concept of cyber risks and the impact that they, they can have is up within business leadership teams but there's still not a full and clear understanding of what that really means in terms of the potential impact on the business the ramifications how big they could be how long lasting they could be where those risks are coming from which parts of the organization are particularly vulnerable and in practical terms how to respond to them so there's an awareness and a willingness but there's still not a full understanding or clarity that enables all organizations to move forward in a really effective and practical manner. And I think probably for some of the people on this call, that's one of the challenges they're, they're wrestling with. How can we um, bring to life the threat posed by uh, cyber incidents and how can we get colleagues across the business um, to engage 
in a really effective uh, manner. I want to share with you a um, case study, one of the more famous cyber attacks, and this is really to illustrate the broad, deep and long-lasting business impact of a cyber attack that I think if business leaders were to read this, uh, it might open their eyes to actually how significant the risk is and the impact that it can have. And that's the Maersk cyber attack, which took place uh, in June of 2017. This is an article, about, about 3,000 word article in Wired magazine. And after this session, uh, we'll be sending you a link to this article. It's fascinating. And it talks about A, how it happened, B, uh, what the impact was and see how the organization responded. I particularly wanted to focus on the impact because I think this scale and scope of impact is what business leaders need to really understand in order for them to uh, fully engage with this with this topic. So the attack actually wasn't specifically intended to um, hit Maersk. It was a broader attack allegedly um, which came from Russia attacking uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian businesses and organizations. And as a consequence of that attack, one single infection on a single Maersk computer in the Ukraine opened the door to a massive crisis for the entire Maersk organization. Within hours, this global shipping and terminal operating business was suffering major, major business impacts. Their ports were inaccessible to trucks because all of the gates are controlled by technology and systems. Trucks have to be scanned in, containers have to be scanned in. None of that was working. So there were queues of lorries trying to get in and out of Maersk's ports around the world. Their offices were inaccessible, access control was governed by a system which was compromised. Their phone systems didn't work because that was part of the network. Their normal office systems didn't work. The central booking system went down. There were no printers because they're all on the network. They had no idea where any of the thousands and thousands of containers that they manage were, or indeed what was in an individual container because that is all on the system. Cranes were frozen in suspended animation. The operational systems were impacted. And of course, the normal means of communication, email, the company website, they were all unavailable. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And that is within hours. The organization was fundamentally paralyzed. They unplugged everything to stop to stop the uh, virus spreading further. What about the longer term impact? Because I think one of the other challenges to overcome with leaders is uh, a belief or maybe a hope that this is a problem that can be sorted within 24 hours, two or three days, four or five days. An attack of this magnitude has a long term impact. It was at least two weeks before Maersk was able to start operating anything like normally, not completely normally, but anything like normally. It was also two weeks before office space staff began to be issued with new laptops. And by the way, of course, they were completely clean laptops. So anything that had been saved to an individual uh, laptop that had that had gone. And it was five to six months before the organization had a fully functioning IT infrastructure in place to support the core business. So recognizing that a significant cyber incident is not a 24 hour incident, but could potentially be months and could very likely be transformational for the business uh, in either a good or a, or a bad way is really important to recognize and also recognizing um, the real breadth of impact and really thinking through where could some of those impacts be, be felt. Um, the claimed cost of the incident quoted in the article based on a quote from Maersk's chairman was $300 million. 
Uh, others have speculated the cost was actually significantly higher. Um, this was an attack which actually affected lots of other organizations as well. The White House assessed the total damage to business to be $10 billion. And I guess one of the even broader impacts of this attack was its impact on the global supply chain. If you imagine the amount of um, products and goods that were being transported via the sea, via the containers, um, via trucks, uh, the knock-on impact to the global supply chain was also significant at a time when uh, the supply chain was under pressure anyway. So this just illustrates the massive ramifications of a cyber attack on a big organization. So how can we prepare for that? Uh, I love this uh, analogy from the aviation sector. It's a quote from uh, a pilot, a pilot called Kim Green, and they said, when it's just you and your craft at 5,000 feet, what matters most is experience especially when the weather turns inclement or the engine goes quiet. You can be a whiz at aerodynamics and know your equipment like an engineer, but it's how you react when everything goes wrong that shows what kind of pilot you really are. Business leaders face down everything from PR headaches to financial crises, and sometimes even threats to health and human life within their organizations. You can bring your A game to the boardroom and know your industry inside out, but if you've never handled a major emergency, it's hard to know how well you'll fare when your first one hits. That's why pilots are trained in crisis management. We're taught to think through a range of potential mishaps, memorize checklists, and plot courses of action in advance. Executives can do the same. This is relevant to all crisis management, but in a when you're planning, for a cyber incident, knowing what you might be facing in advance, developing some checklists, making some in principle decisions ahead of time, plotting courses of action to respond, doing that ahead of time and rehearsing it, of course, is a really effective way of giving you confidence that you will respond in a purposeful and appropriate manner should the worst occur. And I want to compare and contrast uh, a couple of uh, cases uh, where my suspicion is that in one case there had been good preparation and in the other maybe that preparation was not quite as uh, full as it should have been. So we're going to take a quick look at Travelex first of all, sticking with the ransomware theme. Travelex, the foreign exchange business, was hit with a ransomware attack uh, over Christmas 2020. Its website went down, its online foreign exchange portal was unavailable, the systems that it provided to banks and other uh, franchised outlets, they were also inoperable. And ultimately, many of those systems, as per uh, Maersk, were out of action for at least a month. And again, it took a long time to actually get full functionality back. Um, again, when we look at those, um, dual priorities that you're juggling, the fixing the problem, the communication side. Um, TravelX were grappling with the problem itself, but what they clearly did was prioritize that rather than uh, the communication side. So whilst anyone going onto TravelX's website or online portal to order currency couldn't access it, TravelX didn't actually say anything until the second day of the of the incident. So there was nearly 48 hours when systems were down and publicly down and the organization had said nothing. And their first communication was with a single tweet. Six days later, they issued their second tweet and 12 days into the crisis, the chief executive put out a statement. We all understand how hard it is to communicate in a crisis and the fear of saying too much or saying the wrong thing, but there is clearly an equal uh, danger, if not greater danger, of allowing others to fill that vacuum for you. And one of the key points that I'd pull out uh, in this situation that I think is relevant to 
all of the organizations on this uh, on this call is that when we talk about communication in a crisis there's a temptation to think almost exclusively about the media and social media there are many other stakeholders but one of the stakeholders that is critical in almost every crisis and certainly in a cyber crisis is your own people your employees they can be either your best allies in a crisis or they can be your biggest problem and sadly for travelx they turned into the organization's biggest problem not over not only did they have disgruntled customers they had disgruntled employees and there were a number of them that were quoted uh, in the BBC, on the BBC website. So uh, let me read out three or four of the quotes from several different employees at TravelX at the time. One source said his company's communication with employees seemed to be a masterclass in what not to do. Another one told the BBC, I couldn't help but laugh at the suggestion that the public response has been shockingly bad. This is nothing compared to how it's been handled internally. It feels like there is a distinct lack of real leadership and communication. And a third said, I work for TravelX and low down in the ranks, we have no clue what is happening. We are as frustrated and upset as the customers are. So however hard you're working to fix the problem, the technical or operational problem, it's vital that you are also at the same time doing whatever you can to communicate and reassure the stakeholders who are affected by it and who can either speak on your behalf in a best case or in a worst case can become your biggest critics and that's particularly important when it comes to your own people your employees um, and this again comes down to planning it's what you do before the event to work out and determine how would we communicate with our stakeholders who are our stakeholders how would we do that in the absence of email you won't be able to muddle through at the time on gut instinct alone now for those of you um, who joined us 12 months ago and attended the norsh kidro uh, webinar when we uh, interviewed Inga Setoff, the head of the vice president of communication at Norsh Kidro, this will not be a new case study, but it presents a really interesting counterbalance to the TravelX uh, case, which I've just talked about. Norsh Kidro, big aluminium manufacturer based in Norway. Guess what? Like every other organization we've been talking about over the last half an hour or so. Um, they were the victim of a ransomware attack which brought both their operational and their office systems to a grinding halt at 4 a.m. in the morning European time. What happened? Well, the guy who was uh, on call on site at 4 a.m. in the morning, he alerted the crisis management team that there was a problem and that they should meet and discuss what to do next. That crisis management team had their meeting within an hour of the problem becoming apparent, despite the fact it struck at 4 a.m. in the morning. This is an organization which has prepared. There is no way you would be able to notify, escalate and activate your crisis management team at 4 a.m. in the morning if some pre-planning hadn't taken place and actually all be on the same call within 60 minutes at 4 a.m. in the morning that is pretty impressive what they also did in that first meeting is they endorsed two in principle decisions that they had made before the crisis in principle decision one which they ratified was we will not pay the ransom and in principle decision two that they ratified was we will communicate openly transparently and prolifically those decisions were much easier to take because of the thinking that they had done beforehand and indeed because they were also both of those decisions in line with Norsh Kidro's values which is one of the critical things when shaping a crisis response acting in the way that you have told the outside world to expect of your organization. So, in contrast with a number of other organizations, 
that's exactly what Norsh Kidro did. They did communicate prolifically. They issued three statements within the first 24 hours uh, of the attack taking place. They held um, staff briefings on a daily basis. They briefed the media on a daily on a daily basis. Indeed, they even brought, as the saga continued, they they brought journalists into their offices to see how their teams were recovering the organization. Surprise, surprise, at the end of uh, the situation, not only did um, Norsh Kidro uh, preserve its reputation, its share price went up. Um, the key message here, though, is none of this would have been possible without the organization taking the time to think and prepare in advance. It's that that gives you the ability to be so swift, so confident and so purposeful as and when the crisis occurs. Uh, please do post any questions that you have as we go through. As I say, I will respond to them uh, at the end, but if you do have any questions as I talk, put them in the question pane and we'll uh, deal with as many as we can at the end. So, as those of you who work in crisis management, business continuity, business resilience, uh, emergency planning, who are on this call know there are some critical things that you need to do to prepare for any crisis situation. Um, and it is certainly relevant to a cyber incident. It's about assessing, assessing the risk, assessing how you might be compromised and understanding what the impact of those risks could be. Planning, scenario planning, I'm gonna come on to that in a minute, and having a plan which relates to a cyber instance. And what I must emphasize at this point is, this cannot be a plan which solely relates to the technical response to uh, the crisis. I've talked about different parameters of a crisis earlier on. This is another different parameter. Yes, you need uh, the technical wizards to be able to remediate what's happened, but there will also be senior leaders who are going to have to make business decisions around what has happened. So being geared up technically is great, but it's not enough. The leadership team and the managers who will be involved with the response also need to be briefed. And by the way, the technical guys and the managerial guys, they need to understand what each other are doing, what each other need, and also what each other don't need in terms of stepping on each other's on each other's toes. So this kind of comes back to the uh, Davos research around achieving a really good level of understanding and collaboration between the different parts of the business. Training, giving people the skills that they require to play their role within a crisis management team responding uh, to a cyber incident, and critically, exercising, rehearsing the response to a cyber incident, not per Kim Green, the pilot, doing it for the first time when you are in the white hot heat of the crisis itself. Um, so I wanted to go back to the planning segment of this graphic and talk about in advance scenario planning. Some of the things that uh, Norsh Kidro did that enabled them to respond quickly and some of the things that uh, came out of the Maersk case study that you might want to be in fact, I'd be strongly encouraging you to think about in advance of the crisis so that you're not blindsided when it happens. This is not a comprehensive list of questions that you should ask, but what it is, is uh, a good starting point for understanding and being clear about how we would respond to a major cyber incident. So before it happens, ask yourselves, who would be on our crisis management team? In the event of a cyber incident, what additional partners and expert advisors will we need? Do we have them? No. Well, let's get them. Have we got their contact details? No. Out of hours? No. Who will they be and make sure that you have their details? How would you operate as a crisis management team without your core systems? Don't rely on everything being a business as usual. The nature of a cyber attack means that it won't be business as usual. Where would you meet both physically and virtually? How would you feed the team? Where will they sleep? 
one of the things that Maersk had to do is book out hundreds of hotel rooms for the people who gathered together, the techies who gathered together to restore the systems. Do you know where you would put up your people? Are there enough hotel rooms? If not, where else would, would these people be able to sleep? How will you feed them in the middle of the night when they're working 24 hours a day? How will you access the crisis management plan if it's on one of your systems? What is your stance on paying ransom demands? What's your policy? What are the criteria? What are the triggers? That may need to be a policy that isn't written down, but it's definitely a discussion that uh, should be taking place. And what is the legal position? You know, what is the view of your uh, local uh, or national law enforcement around the paying of ransoms? Because clearly that needs to uh, play an important part in your thinking. And indeed related to that, when and how do we engage with the police and law enforcement? Don't wait till the attack happens to find out what's required and who's likely to be interested from an emergency services and law enforcement perspective. So that's kind of some of the questions to ask yourself around the crisis response. There are also questions to ask yourselves regarding the organisational and business impact. Kinds of questions you need to be asking because they're questions you would be asking definitely in the situation itself. What if we don't have any IT? Let's go through a planning exercise that says we literally have no IT. What would we do and how? What are our critical business processes and which are the most important? which should be restored first? Know the answers to those questions ahead of time. Finance, how do we bill our customers if finance systems are down? How do we pay our people? How do we receive payments? How will we access our buildings? What's the impact if systems are down for, let's say, more than a week? This is to try and overcome this optimism bias that says everything will be all right pretty quickly. Ask yourself the tough questions. What if it isn't over quickly? What manual workarounds can we deploy? What ex-employees do we know, maybe retired employees that we can bring back who understand the manual systems? That was one of the things that Norsh Kidro did. And where would we get hundreds, maybe thousands of clean laptops quickly? And then from a communication point of view, the first question is the most important and the one that helps you to answer all of the subsequent questions. How do you want to be perceived at the end of this crisis? What do you want people to be saying and thinking about your organisation in terms of how you responded to this attack? That will then shape what you say, how you say it. So what, on the basis of how we want to be perceived, what is our approach to communication? How quickly would we want to communicate? How frequently, how transparent would we want to be? When, when must we brief the regulator? Who are they? How do we brief them? Have we got their contact details? Who else must we or will we communicate with? Who are our stakeholders? And who are the most important stakeholders in a variety of cyber scenarios? Don't wait till the event to work out the answers to those questions. How will we communicate with them? What channel? What about if there's no email? What about if there's no website? Again, Norsh Kidro turned to Facebook in the absence of their own website to communicate online with their stakeholders. Who approves communication materials? How quickly can that happen? It needs to happen a lot faster than in business as usual. Two days is not going to cut the mustard in a crisis if you're to exert influence over the external perception. What are your in-principle messages? Who speaks to the media? Is it going to be the head of IT? Is it going to be the CEO? What are the triggers? What are the criteria for different spokespeople? And what additional resources might you need to manage the sheer weight of attention that will be focused on the organisation when you find yourself in the centre of this storm? So, as I say, these are indicative questions for you to think about and do some proper scenario planning ahead of the event so that you have visibility of a future that you hope you never have to uh, live through. But if you do, you'll be pleased you've done that thinking uh, in the cool, calm of a business as usual environment rather than in the less cool and calm environment which a crisis brings. 
okay, we're now moving into uh, the final stretch of the presentation. Um, and uh, we're going to cover now, I'm going to cover now two or three processes, techniques, thinking uh, styles, which I think will really help you uh, in, a, in a crisis. And we're going to apply those to a scenario. So the first concept that I wanted to uh, brief you on is strategic intent. Now, we all know that a crisis is high pressure, unusual with high stakes and unusual threatening high stakes high pressure environments gets the adrenaline flowing and it forces or certainly encourages people to leap to action sometimes without thinking and setting strategic intent at the start of your crisis response and indeed this is something that actually can be done again as part of your planning but as a minimum at the start of your crisis response gives everybody a focus for what they are seeking to achieve. So what do I mean by setting strategic intent? It's about the leadership team at the beginning of the crisis or even better beforehand, determining when we get to the end of this, what do we want to have achieved? Where do we want to be? I guess my um, summary of that would be, what does success look like? So articulate in writing what your strategic intent is so that the whole team is focused towards the same end goal. That can be very helpful when you have two choices in terms of a decision. You can evaluate choice A versus choice B and say which of these is most in keeping with our strategic intent or most likely to lead to our strategic intent. A prioritization it means when there is competition for resources or attention you can prioritize the activity which um, is most related to achieving your strategic intent and because strategic intent is long term and an end position it's very unlikely to change during the course of a crisis I can promise you that probably 99 times out of a hundred Without um, training or rehearsal, teams will leap to action without thinking what they are seeking to achieve, what success looks like. And yes, it takes up to 15 minutes um, to get that nailed down, but it will serve you really well uh, in a crisis. So I'm going to test, um, test strategic intent out against a situation which I'm going to present you with. Here it is. Today, you're all working for Orion, one of the world's leading online retailers specializing in consumer electronics, employs over 100,000 people globally, also has 100 million customers, and generates over $53 billion of revenue per year. And its customers admire and trust Orion based on high levels of customer service and care. And the promise, the, the brand promises our products to your door the same day, every day. They're subject to a big takeover from Amazon, which is uh, talks are progressing at the moment. And its high profile CEO, Anita Rani, is speaking at a global cyber security summit next Monday. So it's what, 20 minutes, 20 minutes from now, and your CISO briefs you that there's been a data breach customers phone numbers emails addresses dates of birth and employees home addresses are all compromised there's no evidence that customer financial data has been compromised but it can't be ruled out and the hackers are demanding a ransom in return for not selling the information on the dark web there is currently no external visibility of the attack and technical teams are investigating we're going to launch a poll in a moment and I would like you and I'm going to force you to choose one of these five strategic intents if you were uh, making the final decision for Orion's crisis management team so Catherine if you can if you can launch that poll please and then uh, everybody on this uh, call please uh, cast your vote as to which of these strategic intents you would uh, vote for. So 
I can see just over half of you have voted. Three quarters. So Catherine will take it through to 60 seconds and then we'll close the poll. So you've got 10 seconds, everyone, if you haven't cast your vote yet to do so. Okay. Catherine, if you can share those results, please. Okay. So I'm hoping that everyone is now seeing those uh, those results. Could someone just quickly post in the chat box to confirm that they are seeing them, please? Okay, I've got a. I can see hands up, so I'm taking that to be yes. Okay, so um, the top answer with 42% is to retain the trust of our employees and customers. Uh, in second place is establish the scale and scope of the breach with communicate openly and transparently and put customer interest first and minimize business disruption right about the same and no one voting for minimize business disruption per our brand promise so for those of you that chose uh, retain the trust of our employees and customers that is a good strategic intent and by a good strategic intent i mean that in uh, two ways one it fulfills the definition of what a strategic intent should be because it defines an end position it defines what success looks like you could measure the extent to which you had achieved that strategic intent it's also a good one because it is uh, long term it is in the best long term interests of the business so that is a good strategic intent for those of you that voted for establish the scale and scope of the breach and its impact, it's a critical early action, but it is not a strategic intent because that is not an end position. So at the end of the crisis, simply to have established the scale and scope of the breach and its impact is not a measure of success. So it's absolutely a critical action, but it is not a strategic intent. Um, for those of you that voted communicate openly and transparently, that is probably in the best interest of achieving a strategic intent, but it is not a strategic intent in its own right. It is, a, it is how you might achieve another strategic intent. It is not a strategic intent in itself because it is not an end goal. Um, for those of you that voted C, put customer interest first and minimize the financial and operational impact on the business. Um, you might like to do that. The problem with that strategic intent is that it has potentially two competing objectives in one strategic intent. So if a particular course of action is going to benefit customers, but actually be very costly and maybe slow down recovery of the business, how are you going to square that? So strategic intents are best when they are single-minded. And if they're not single-minded, as a minimum, you need to uh, prioritize. Say, if push comes to shove, this is more important than this one. No one voted for minimized business disruption per our brand promise. The one thing that strategic intent, uh, or two things it has going for it, one is that it is a strategic intent because it is an end result. And two is, it is in line with your values. However, it is unlikely to serve you well in the long term. So I'm now gonna go back, I hope, to showing my screen. So could, um, again, could someone just let me know that you are once more seeing my screen, please? I'm taking that as a, yeah, I've got lots of yeses. Fantastic, thank you. So let's move on. Let's talk about main effort. This is the second concept that I wanted to share with you. Uh, we've talked about strategic intent. What is main effort? Main effort is defined as concentrating efforts on achieving objectives that lead to victory. What does that mean? Well, what that means is 
you won't be able to do everything all at the same time. Much as you would like to do so, you will not have enough time or resources to be able to cover all of the bases you would like to cover at any stage of the crisis. Therefore, successful cri crisis management is about prioritization. And defining your main effort is saying, what is the most important area of focus at the current stage of the crisis? I know there's 50 things that we would like to do, but right now, what is the most important thing that we must do? Having defined that, the main effort will be prioritized for support with resources. In other words, a disproportionate amount of resources will go to support and achieve your main effort. It's also harmonizing. It means that everybody on the team, indeed everybody on the organization, can play their part in achieving the main effort. But because main effort is around what is the priority area of focus right now, unlike strategic intent, main effort will very likely change during the crisis. And what I should also say is that your main effort should link into and drive towards your strategic intent. They should be linked, they should be synergistic. So thinking about the scenario with which you have been presented, what would your main effort be? And I'm gonna be cruel here, you can only vote once, I'm sure you would like to vote for more than one of these, but which of these five potential main efforts do you believe is most appropriate at this moment in time? Establish how we're breached so we can fix vulnerabilities, work with law enforcement to catch the cyber criminals, develop your comms plan, find workarounds to avoid disruptions to deliveries, or decide whether to pay the ransom. Catherine, if you could launch that one, please. And again, we'll give you 45 to 60 seconds to vote. Okay, so 10 seconds and then Catherine, if you can close it when it gets to 60. Okay. So, a bit, bit more of a spread on, uh, on the second poll. So, uh, the highest percentage was developing our stakeholder communication plan. Uh, second highest was finding workarounds to avoid disruptions to deliveries. Third highest is establishing how we were breached to fix vulnerabilities. 9% going for working with law enforcement and 5% on deciding whether to pay the ransom. Um, I absolutely endorse the low level of votes for deciding whether to pay the ransom and working with law enforcement. They are not uh, your top priorities at this moment in the crisis. And if deciding whether to pay the ransom is, that says that you probably haven't done the thinking uh, beforehand. So again, they're important, but they're probably not the most important right now. Uh, there's an argument to be made for those that voted around establishing how we were breached so we can fix vulnerabilities, try to stop the situation getting, getting worse. Um, there's an argument for the finding workarounds to avoid disruption to deliveries, particularly if you voted for your strategic intent to be to minimize impact on, on the business and, and deliveries. If that was your strategic intent, then you've also chosen the correct, in terms of alignment, uh, main effort. Um, and developing our stakeholder communication plan, that is also clearly of critical importance because word of this is going to get out very, very quickly. So there are no absolute right or wrong answers. Uh, in the real world, you probably would be looking at doing both establishing how we were breached and developing your comms plan. But say so what you mustn't do is end up with 50 
different uh, key areas because you will make such slow incremental progress that you will never end up um, getting ahead of the crisis. And going back to the presentation, talking about getting ahead of uh, the crisis, it's easy to be critical of organizations for seeming to simply react to events rather than influence or shape them. And certainly, whilst you can never be masters of your own destiny and control uh, perceptions in a, in a crisis, you certainly should be seeking to influence them. And one of the best ways of doing that is scenario planning. And again, this is very, very often overlooked in the heat uh, and the pressure of a crisis. Actually, looking ahead is something that organizations often fail to do, as I say, in the heat and pressure of a crisis. So what do we mean by scenario planning? Well, it's about assigning a couple of people to be outside of the main crisis management team in a quiet room. We call them creative pessimists um, to consider what could happen next. How could the situation deteriorate? What are the real worst case scenarios? They then bring their conclusions and thoughts back to the crisis management team for them to prepare accordingly. Forewarned is forearmed and having foresight of what could happen and particularly foresight of your worst nightmares enables you to prepare for them. Okay, I'm gonna not going to ask you to answer those questions, but please in a real situation do. Decision making, the final uh, part of the scenario. So the situation has not been resolved. The technical team is still working to fix vulnerabilities. We're now uh, tomorrow, it's already been going on 24 hours. 18 million customer records have been offered for sale on the dark web. Orion share price has dropped by 14%. In addition, in addition to employee and customer data, confidential corporate data has also been stolen, including emails relating to unethical behavior of Orion employees, details of gagging clauses included in terminations of employment, and sensitive information relating to the takeover. And you won't be surprised to hear the media is all over it, and the coverage is not pretty from an Orion perspective. Decision making in a crisis is never easy, but your CEO, Anita Rani, you'll recall that she is speaking at a global cyber conference on Monday, or certainly due to be. And she asks you whether she should proceed with that opportunity. Not an easy decision, yes or no. Catherine, if you could load up that poll, what would your advice to Anita Rani be? Whilst you're voting, I'm going to answer two of the questions that have come in because I'm aware we're heading towards the top of the hour. Um, Jenny, um, with regards to TravelX, their share price did drop significantly, 24% on the back of uh, the crisis. I would need to uh, check how they're doing now, but it did have, as a minimum, a significant medium term impact on the business. And Will, who is asking whether developing a comms plan at the onset of a crisis is too late. Um, yes, in the sense that every organization as part of its crisis management plan should have a crisis communication plan with principals and stakeholders listed. Clearly, it will need to be tailored and developed according to the precise situation. But having the fundamentals in place, absolutely. Catherine, if we can stop the poll now. So we've got 76% who say yes and 24% who say no. That shows that, again, there is no right and wrong answer in a crisis and decision making is about making the best decision you can with the information you have available at that time in line with your values and based on the courage of a leader to make a decision. For those of you who voted yes, uh, my assumption is that you would do that in order to help to shape the, the narrative to actually step forward and provide the context uh, and to show that uh, Orion is taking this 
situation seriously to to front it up which is an entirely legitimate uh approach for those who've said no i would be imagining that you're saying no because a it brings risk putting the ceo in front of a room full of media and other stakeholders where they could be um kind of lambs to the slaughter and in addition people might question what is the ceo doing at a conference uh, when there's this major crisis and customers are suffering. So decision making in a crisis is not a perfect science, um, but it is about making those, those decisions. And uh, I think this is one of those situations whereby in a scenario, uh, I would certainly be voting yes. Uh, whether Anita Rani herself would agree to do that in the real world, who knows. I'm gonna just take you into the final a uh, few slides of the presentation. Um, so, if you're considering how prepared you are for a crisis, uh, we'll be sending out a link in the follow-up uh, email for you to take our online crisis readiness test. So it's completely free, it generates uh, quite a detailed report across a number of parameters, so you could perhaps see uh, where you're strong and where you're less strong. We'll also send you a link to download this um, 10 tips for developing an effective cyber crisis plan. And I mentioned at the beginning uh, that there are also three copies of Crisis Proof to be won. So again, the post webinar email will, will be landing with you in the next 24 hours. If you simply reply to that email saying that you would like to go into the draw for crisis proof then we will put you into that draw um it is one minute to i believe two minutes to i've answered the first couple of questions that i've seen um i will happily continue for another three or four minutes if anybody uh, has any further questions If not, please feel free to use the contact details on this slide to connect with me after the session. I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions that we haven't had time to uh, cover during the session itself. Uh, I think one of the key messages that I would uh, leave you with again is that there are a number of things that need to be balanced during a cyber crisis. One is um, doing and saying the right things at the same time, fixing the problem and communicating well. Therefore, it's really important to get both parts of that equation working together in planning for your cyber response. So exercising together, scenario planning together, so there's a real understanding to overcome the barrier that still to some extent exists as was highlighted by the World Economic Forum research. Thank you so much for joining us for the last hour. I hope and trust that you've got uh, some useful insight and value out of this session. As I say, any questions, anything that I can help you with, please do contact me. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us and I wish you a pleasant, quiet and crisis-free rest of your day. Thank you very much.